Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaskar students and welcome to Swayam Prabha. I am Dr. Vageshwari Deswal, a professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. We are doing a 20 hour course on Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita 2023, the substantive law on crimes. Today, we will be discussing lesson number 14 the title of this lesson is Terrorist Act, Hurt, Grievous Hurt and Acid Attacks. So as is self-explanatory from the title of this chapter itself, we will be dealing with the offenses of terrorist attack, what constitutes hurt, when does a hurt amount to grievous hurt and what is acid attack. So let us now discuss all of these crimes in detail. First of all, let us try and understand what amounts to a terrorist act. This is a new provision which has been introduced by the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. Prior to this, we had a definition of terrorist activities under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, UAPA. But now, we have also included terrorist act as a crime under our main substantive law on crimes which earlier was the Indian Penal Code and now it is the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. So under section 113 we have defined what amounts to a terrorist act. So what does the law say? Whoever does any act with the intent to threaten or likely to threaten the unity, integrity, sovereignty, security or economic security of India or with the intent to strike terror or which is likely to strike terror in the people or any section of the people in India or in any foreign country. So you see the terrorist act that has been defined herein, it is not restricted to terrorist activities which are done in India. What it says is any act which is a terrorist act whether in India or whether it is done in a foreign country. Anything which is done with the intent to strike terror or which is likely to strike terror in the people or any section of people in India or in any foreign country. So the objective of law is to prevent any kind of an alarm or scare being created by an offense which has the likelihood to disturb the peace of the society, to disturb the people, to terrorize them, to create an atmosphere of fear in the people. So that would be a terrorist act. Now what would be the means that can be employed to conduct these terrorist attacks? One, it could be by using bombs, dynamite or other explosive substance or inflammable substances or firearms or other lethal weapons or poisonous or noxious gases or other chemicals or by any other substance. See when we are drafting a law in 2023 implementing in 2024 we have to be mindful of the scientific and technological advancements. Now chemical attacks are also increasing by the day. So we have to take care of all these things and that is why we have such a comprehensive definition which takes into account terrorist uh, attacks which are done by bombs or explosive substances or even which are done by any chemicals or other substances whether biological, radioactive, nuclear or otherwise of a hazardous nature or by any other means of whatever nature to cause or likely to cause. So what should be the impact of this? Death of or injury to any person or persons. So it is not necessary that it should result in death. 
See what if it is prevented on time, but what is required is that the act should be such that it should have the likelihood of causing death or injury. Second, loss of or damage to or destruction of property. So, whether there is harm of life, harm of property, either ways it would be a terrorist attack. If it leads to disruption of any supplies or services essential to the life of the community in India or in any foreign country or damage to the monetary stability of India by way of production or smuggling or circulation of counterfeit Indian paper currency, coin or of any other material, damage or destruction of any property in India or in a foreign country used or intended to be used for the defense of India or in connection with any other purposes of the government of India, any state government or of any of their agencies or overalls by means of criminal force or the show of criminal force or attempts to do so or causes death of any public functionary or attempts to cause death of any public functionary or detains, kidnaps or abducts any person and threatening to kill or injure such person or does any other act in order to compel the government of India, any state government or the government of a foreign country or an international or intergovernmental organization or any other person to do or abstain from doing any act commits a terrorist act. So, you see the definition of terrorist act, it is so, so broad based. Now, students, the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act and the earlier laws which we had TADA, POTA. So, the UAPA is also a special legislation. Special legislations work in conditions that are different from ordinary conditions and therefore, special laws are created with the objective of addressing special situations. So, for this, a new legal structure is established. Special laws define new offences and they also provide special investigative and adjudicatory procedures to be followed in the prosecution of those offences. Therefore, provisions of the CRPC, BNSS now, to the extent that they are inconsistent with the special provisions of the Unlawful Activities Preventive Act are inapplicable to prosecutions under the statute. For the purposes of the definition of terrorism for the purposes of this subsection, how do we understand some of the terms? See, not all terms have been defined here, but the terms that have been defined, let us try and understand them. First one is public functionary. So, public functionary means the constitutional authorities or any other functionary notified in the official gazette by the central government as a public functionary. Counterfeit Indian currency means the counterfeit currency as may be declared after examination by an authorized or notified forensic authority that such currency imitates or compromises with the key security features of Indian currency. Now coming to the punishments. So clause 2 says whoever commits a terrorist act shall if such offence has resulted in the death of any person, be punished with death or imprisonment for life and shall also be liable to fine. So, you see the penalties that have been prescribed, they are directly proportionate to the damage that has resulted from the offence, that the damage which has actually resulted or which was capable of, the act was capable of resulting in that kind of a damage. So, that is how the gradation of punishments has been done herein. So, if the offence has resulted in death, the punishment would also be death or imprisonment for life. In any other case, it would be punished with imprisonment for a, for a term which shall not be less than 5 years, but which may extend to imprisonment for life. See, even if death is not caused, but any other damage to property or any other damage has been caused, still 
the liability for involving in a terrorist act would be not less than imprisonment for five years and all depending on the facts and circumstances of a case, the judge may as per his discretion award even the sentence of imprisonment for life and also fine. Then whoever conspires or attempts to commit or advocates, abets, advises or incites whether directly or whoever knowingly facilitates the commission of a terrorist act or any act which is preparatory to the commission of a terrorist act shall be punished with imprisonment for a term which shall again not be less than five years but which may also extend to imprisonment for life. So you see even conspiring, abetting commission of terrorist act or even attempting to commit a terrorist act it has been made strictly punishable under the law. Next is whoever organizes or causes to be organized any camp or camps for imparting training in terrorist act or recruits or causes to be recruited any person or persons for commission of a terrorist act shall be punished with imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than five years but which may extend to imprisonment for life and shall also be liable for fine. So this is a clause which has been inserted in order to nip the evil in the bud. We have to try and avoid the preparation of terrorists for this whoever is trying to impart training to people to train them as terrorists even if you are doing that irrespective of the fact whether people trained by you they in, got involved in a terrorist activity or not. But even the mere act of imparting training of terrorist activities to a person has been made punishable under the law. Then any person who is a member of an organization which is involved in terrorist act shall be punished with imprisonment for a term which may extend to imprisonment for life and shall also be liable for fine. So see even if you are a member of an organization which is involved in terrorist act irrespective of the fact whether you did anything or you did not do anything in the planning or the perpetration of any terrorist activity even if you are involved with such an organization that in itself is sufficient to make you liable for imprisonment and what can be the extent of such imprisonment imprisonment for life next is whoever voluntarily harbors or conceals. So here what is important is the act of harboring, the act of concealment, it should be a voluntary act or attempts to harbor or conceal any person knowing that such person has committed a terrorist act. So here the element of mens rea is very very clear in case it was something which you were not aware of. You were not aware of the person being a terrorist or of the person being involved in a terrorist activity then that could be a defense but if you have voluntarily harbored such a person after the person has committed a terrorist act you have provided shelter to such a person or even while the person is in the uh, preparation stage you are concealing such a person or you are attempting to harbor or conceal any person despite knowing that such person has committed a terrorist act then the act is punishable with imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than three years but which may extend to imprisonment for life and shall also be liable to fine. So irrespective of your moralities even if you feel that maybe this person has committed a wrong and maybe this person deserves a second chance or maybe this person will be a reformed person but see if the person has committed something which has been declared to be a crime and that too of the magnitude of a terrorist activity mere providing of shelter would also be a punishable offense under the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. Such a person has to be handed over to the law authorities because such a person deserves to be tried and punished in accordance with the provisions of the law. Moreover, the objective of putting in such a provision is a person who is engaged in terrorist activities, if you are shielding such a person from law, you don't know, the person might be again preparing to carry out any terrorist attack. There is a possibility that the person might be privy to some such confidential information which should necessarily be disclosed to the law authorities. That is why even shielding such a person after commission of a crime is a crime in itself. Provided 
that this subsection shall not apply to any case in which the harbor or concealment is by the spouse of the offender. So now that is understandable because many times spouses, they might not be able to provide information of the other spouse. So this is a subsection which does not apply to them. Next, whoever knowingly possesses any property derived or obtained from commission of any terrorist act or acquired through the commission of any terrorist act shall be punished with imprisonment for a term which may extend to imprisonment for life and shall also be liable to fine. So despite knowing that this is a property which has been derived or obtained from commission of a terrorist act, if you are enjoying the possession of such property, if you are holding such property, that in itself is also a very, very serious offense which is punishable with imprisonment up to life. Now explanation, explanation was very very important in this provision because it has clarified the registration or prosecution of cases under section 113 of the BNS. See this we have already discussed that we already had a special law which was the UAPA. Okay. Now when there is a special law, a special criminal law statute. Now we have certain general exceptions in the criminal law, in the substantive criminal law. Now those general exceptions, they are applicable to all the crimes that are given under the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. But when the question of applicability of those general exceptions arises in respect of any special statutes, so those exceptions they are applicable in a very limited or rather a truncated form. So what would happen that prosecuting offenders under UAPA was easier, okay, but once we have incorporated terrorist activities in the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. Now, those activities, they are subject to those exceptions also. So, one of the objectives to the best of my capacity is that maybe because of the objective of our law, the new law, which is the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita and the objective is to do justice. So, if we were to introduce the applicability of exceptions to terrorist activities, maybe we would be in a better position to do justice to the victims of terrorism as also to the offenders who have indulged in the act of terrorism. And the second thing is that has been clarified here itself that the officer not below rank of SP shall decide whether to register the case under this section or under the UAPA 1967. So now there is a discretion with the prosecuting agency and that too with an officer who shall not be below the rank of superintendent of police. So depending upon the facts of any case, the superintendent is supposed to take a call whether the case is to be registered under that special law or whether the case would be registered under the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. Now, after terrorist activities, now let us move on to other crimes. Section 114 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita defines hurt. What does it say? It does not say what, uh, what is the offense that is constituted by committing hurt or by committing grievous hurt. It merely defines what amounts to hurt. So whoever causes bodily pain, disease or infirmity to any person is said to cause hurt. Now students, there are confusion among many students and they'll confuse bodily pain with physical pain. Now see physical pain, body consists of our physical self as well as that mental, uh, the mental element is also there. So when we talk about bodily pain, it would be taking account of both physical injuries as well as mental harassment. So whoever causes bodily pain, see pain is not something which can be manifested only in the physical form. Even if you are harassed, even if you are tortured, subjected to cruelty, that is also some kind of a bodily pain. That is a mental pain that is a person is undergoing. So whoever causes bodily pain, disease or infirmity 
to any person. When you are not able to use any body part properly, even for the shortest duration of time, so that is infirmity. See here the law is not talking about permanent infirmity. So infirmity even if it is for a short duration, maybe you have been shocked or stunned by something, maybe somebody gets hysterical upon seeing something. So it could also, maybe you are stunned, you are not able to move your hand for some time because there is some harm that was caused to the hand or any such thing that would amount to hurt. So, this is the definition simply said of the term hurt. Then voluntarily causing hurt. See what is punishable under law is not merely causing of hurt. Under law what is punishable is voluntarily causing of hurt. If you accidentally cause hurt to a person in circumstances that show that you had exercised proper care and precaution yet there was some sort of an inevitable accident due to which a person gets hurt. Now that is not a punishable crime. What is punishable is when you have voluntarily that is deliberately purposefully when you have caused hurt to a person. So what 115 says is voluntary causing hurt. Whoever does any act, so here again act would include omission with the intention of thereby causing hurt to any person. So here we have the highest degree of mens rea that is required here. So whoever does any act with the intention of thereby causing hurt to any person or with the knowledge that he is likely thereby to cause hurt to any person and does thereby cause hurt to any person is said voluntarily to cause hurt. So what is required is that you should have one, either the intention or the knowledge to cause hurt and second thing by that act, actual hurt should have resulted. Say you have the intention to cause hurt or you have the knowledge that I am going to do this thing and by this thing hurt would be caused. Okay? You merely have the intention or knowledge but hurt was not caused. Would that be a crime? No. Similarly, if suppose a person gets hurt but you had no intention or no knowledge to inflict that hurt upon that person. So would again a crime be constituted? Again the answer is no. So in order to voluntarily cause hurt, what is required is that both the conditions they need to coexist. There must be a hurt that should be inflicted and second there must be an intention or knowledge on part of the accused to voluntarily inflict that kind of a hurt. Whoever Except in case provided for by subsection 1 of section 122. We will come to section 122 later, but section 122 talks about grave and sudden provocation. Now, grave and if you were provoked and that too, it was a grave provocation by the other person. Then in such cases, what would happen? This is clause 2 says, whoever except in the case provide for subsection 1 of section 122 voluntarily causes hurt shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 1 year or with fine which may extend to 10,000 rupees or with both. So you see it could be mere imprisonment, it could be mere fine or if the court feels it could be both. But if the cause of hurt was a grave and sudden provocation which came to you from the other person. Then in such cases the liability would be mitigated that is provided under clause 1 of section 122. Now what is grievous hurt? Section 116 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita defines the term grievous hurt. It says the following kinds of hurt only are designated as grievous namely one, emasculation. So emasculation means depriving a man of his masculine vigor such as castration. So it is the only the following kinds of hurt that have been designated as grievous. So this is a strictly inclusive definition. If there is something which does not fall into these categories, it would not amount to grievous hurt. So what it says the following kinds of hurt only. So it has to be a hurt of any of the following kinds in order to qualify to be called as a grievous hurt. So first one would be emasculation, second would be permanent privation of the sight of either eye. So if a person loses eyesight completely in one of the eyes, 
nowadays by advancements in medical science and technology, restoration of vision is a reality. But in order to determine whether the act of accused would amount to grievous hurt or not, what we have to see is what was the nature of injury that was inflicted on the person and had that medical help not been available to this person, what would be the consequence? Would such an injury have led to permanent privation of eyesight or not? If the answer is yes, then the injury is of grievous hurt. Okay. Now, although the eyesight might have been restored by medical interventions, but still it would amount to grievous hurt. Now, sometimes what happens that because criminal law is interpreted in a very strict manner, sometimes people they use the most absurd of arguments to justify their cases. There was one particular case in what, which what happened, there was this case of a hooch tragedy, like people they were producing spurious liquor and it was consumed by a large number of people due to which what happened, many people, around 9, 10 people, they lost their eyesight. Okay. So, the accused person who had supplied that spurious liquor to those people, when he was put up for trial, so his lawyer argued that see those people, they have lost vision in both the eyes. Okay. And he says that what the law says is permanent privation of the sight of either eye. So, since they have lost vision in both the eyes, that could not be covered here because it is talking about either eye. The person should lose eyesight in either the right eye or the left eye. Now, that was a preposterous argument. The court did not listen to such an argument and what they said was that it says sight of either eye. And if a person loses eyesight in both the eyes, so that is definitely an aggravated form of the offence which has been mentioned herein. Then permanent privation of hearing of either ear. So, whether person loses hearing in either of the ears, even if one of the ears, it would amount to a grievous hurt. Then again, there is a possibility that somebody might use a hearing aid of some uh, very high dimension due to which hearing might be restored. But the test of determining whether the hurt was grievous in nature would be that had that technological aid not been available to that person, would that person have permanently lost hearing in that ear or not? If the answer is yes, then it would amount to the offence of grievous hurt. Privation of any member or joint, again breaking of any bone of, I mean there has to be some sort of a fracture. There has to be a privation of any member or joint, later on it might be restored. Then destruction or permanent impairing of the powers of any member or joint, again if permanently you would have lost control over that body part. But due to medical intervention, it could be restored, but still had that medical help not been available, would it be restored in the natural scheme of things or would you have lost control over it for the rest of your life? That would be the test. Then permanent disfiguration of the head or face. See, branding of a person, giving a scar on the cheek or any such thing which is like permanent. Okay, although by resorting to plastic surgeries and all, maybe that could be the original looks could be, could be restored. But by and large, had that not been used, that uh, uh, plastic surgery or any other treatment not been resorted to, so would that scar or brandishment be permanent in nature? So that would be the test. Then fracture or dislocation of a bone or tooth. So, even see, even if there is a fight between friends or even if there is a any sort of a quarrel going on, a roadside quarrel and you give a blow to other person's face and a tooth is knocked out. Now, that is something which amounts to the crime of grievous hurt for which there is a high punishment prescribed under the law. So, dislocation of a tooth is considered to be a grievous hurt. Then, the last clause, it is very, very broad based. So, because see, this is a very inclusive definition and it says that only these kinds of hurts are grievous. So, that is why the last clause has been left open ended. What it says? Any hurt. So, now this is very, very broad, which endangers life or which causes the sufferer to be during the space of 15 days in severe bodily pain 
or unable to follow his ordinary pursuits. That is, if a person has to have his hand in caste for a period of 15 days, or suppose a person has to be hospitalized, a person has been rendered immobile, a person has had to keep a catheter for 15 days, or any such thing which renders a person unable to follow his ordinary pursuits, for a period of 15 days the person is in continuous pain, or any such kind of a hurt which endangers the life of a person. So this is broad in which if there is something which is not covered in the above clauses could be covered here and provided the hurt should be of the extent of the gravity that it can endanger life, causes the sufferer to be in, for, in severe bodily pain for 15 days or when the person is not able to follow his ordinary pursuits, then all such crimes, all such kinds of injuries, they would be covered under the definition of grievous hurt. Then section 117 defines what amounts to voluntarily causing grievous hurt. So what the law says, whoever voluntarily causes hurt, if the hurt which he intends to cause or knows himself to be likely to cause is grievous hurt and if the hurt which he causes is grievous hurt is said voluntarily to cause grievous hurt. So what is required is that voluntariness, the element of voluntariness is absolutely important. Again accidental injuries are not to be included herein. If the hurt which he intends to cause or knows himself to be likely to cause. So here we are talking about both intention as well as, well as knowledge. And what is also required is that the hurt which results from the act should be grievous hurt. That is, it should fall under any of the categories which are given under section 116 of the BNS. Only then it would amount to the offense of voluntarily causing grievous hurt. Explanation. A person is not said voluntarily to cause grievous hurt except when he both causes grievous hurt and intends or knows himself to be likely to cause grievous hurt. So what is required is that the person should have the intent to cause grievous hurt or he should have the knowledge and grievous hurt must have also resulted. Again, even if you have the intention to inflict a grievous hurt but no harm has been caused, it would not be grievous hurt. Okay. Just having an intention or a knowledge that this act can result in grievous hurt but no harm comes to the person. So that would not amount to grievous hurt. But he is said voluntarily to cause grievous hurt if intending or knowing himself to be likely to cause grievous hurt of one kind, he actually causes grievous hurt of another kind. See a person intends to uh, break the leg of another person. <clears throat> but by the act that he does with such intention, he does not break the leg. But what happens? The person is battered so badly that the person has to be hospitalized for a period of 15 days. So although the grievous hurt which he intended was of a different kind and the grievous hurt which resulted was of a different kind, still he would be guilty. Why? Because he had the intention to inflict a grievous hurt and what he actually inflicted was also a grievous hurt. Although the descriptions of what he intended and what he actually inflicted was different, but still there was the intention and there was the resultant consequence. When they have coexisted, it would amount to voluntarily causing grievous hurt. We have certain illustrations for a better clarity. A intending of knowing himself to be likely permanently to disfigure Z's face gives Z a blow which does not permanently disfigure Z's face but which causes Z to suffer severe bodily pain for the space of 15 days. A has voluntarily caused grievous hurt. Now clause 2. Whoever except in the case provided for by subsection 2 of section 122. Again 122 talks about grave and sudden provocation. So if the other person had provoked you and the provocation was sudden before and you acted before you had time to cool down and the provocation was so grave that it would unsettle any person of ordinary sense and calmness and if consequent to that 
provocation, which was both grave as well as sudden. You inflicted an injury with the intent to cause a grievous hurt and the person has actually suffered a grievous hurt because of that. Then what happens? Your liability is mitigated slightly because had it not been for the provocation coming from the side of the other person, you would not have done that injury. So that is why the liability could be slightly reduced. So what it says, whoever except in the case provided for by subsection 2 of section 122 voluntarily causes grievous hurt shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to seven years and shall also be liable to fine. Whoever commits an offence under subsection 1 and in the course of such commission causes any hurt to a person which causes that person to be in a permanent disability or in a persistent vegetative state shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than 10 years but which may extend to imprisonment for life which shall mean imprisonment for the remainder of that person's natural life. Now students clause 3 of this section is a new addition in our substantive criminal law. See, the BNS has introduced some changes in the law relating to grievous hurt. One, the space during which a person should be in intense pain was in IPC 20 days, whereas BNS, it has reduced it to a space of 15 days. Similarly, Clause 3 and Clause 4 have been introduced. Clause 3 talks about those cases where the grievous hurt was of such a nature that the person has been rendered comatose or where the person has been rendered to be in a vegetative state for a long period of time. Then in such cases what happens? The liability increases on part of the accused person. Similarly, if such an act which has resulted in grievous hurt was done by a group of people, see the law discourages tumultuous assemblage of men. So if people have gathered together to commit a crime, that is obviously more serious than a crime being committed by a single person. So, what clause 3 says, whoever commits an offence under subsection 1 and in the course of such commission causes any hurt to a person which causes that person to be in a permanent disability or in a persistent vegetative state shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment. See, the imprisonment also would be not of any description but it would be rigorous and which shall not be less than 10 years. The law has prescribed a minimum imprisonment Plus, it may be extended to imprisonment for life, which shall again, imprisonment for the remainder of that person's natural life. Here, the discretion which vests in the state has been taken away. So, the person, he cannot be released before time. His punishment, it cannot be condoned before time. What he has to remain in prison for the remainder of that person's natural life. Then coming to clause 4, which is again a new addition in the BNS, what it says, when a group of five or more persons, so there have to be a minimum of five people and that group should be acting in concert. Okay? And when they cause grievous hurt to a person on the ground of his race, caste or community, sex, place of birth, language, personal belief or any other similar ground, each member of such group shall be guilty of the offence of causing grievous hurt and shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to seven years and shall also be liable to fine. So this is quite similar to section 103. Now clause 2 which is punishment for murder that is a new addition again which is talking about punishment in cases of mob lynchings, hate crimes, honour killings. Similarly here also when five or more than five people they are acting in concert and when it has caused any kind of a grievous hurt to the person. If the person dies punishment would be under clause 2 of section 103 but if the person does not die then the punishment would be for grievous hurt under clause 4 of this section. Now coming to section 118, voluntarily causing hurt or grievous hurt by dangerous weapons or means. So what the law says is, whoever except in the case provided for by subsection 1 of section 122. Now 122 it is talking about voluntary causing grievous hurt but under the grave and sudden provocation. So whoever except in case provided for by subsection 1 of section 122 voluntarily causes hurt 
by means of any instrument for shooting, stabbing or cutting or any instrument which used as a weapon of offence is likely to cause death or by means of fire or any heated substance or by means of any poison or any corrosive substance or by means of any explosive substance or by means of any substance which it is deleterious to the human body to inhale, to swallow or to receive into the blood or by means of an animal shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 3 years or with fine which may extend to 20,000 rupees or with both. So, the amount of fine it has been substantially raised by the changes that have been introduced by the BNS in 2023. So, you see even if you are employing an animal as a dangerous weapon or means, even that has been taken care of under section 118 of the BNS. Then it says whoever except in case provided for by subsection 2 or 122 voluntarily causes grievous hurt by any means referred to in subsection 1 shall be punished with imprisonment for life or with imprisonment of either description for a term which shall not be less than one year but which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. Now section 119, it talks about voluntarily causing hurt or grievous hurt to extort property or to constrain to an illegal act. So when you have inflicted either a hurt or a grievous hurt to any person and what was the objective behind infliction of such a hurt or grievous hurt was either to extort property from that person or to constrain that person to some illegal activity. So what does the law say? Whoever voluntarily causes hurt for the purpose of extorting from the sufferer or from any person interested in the sufferer any property or valuable security or of constraining the sufferer or any person interested in such sufferer to do anything which is illegal or which may facilitate the commission of an offence shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. So, you see there is a higher punishment prescribed when somebody causes hurt or grievous hurt with the intent to extort property or to compel that person to do an illegal act. So, whoever voluntarily causes grievous hurt for any purpose referred to in subsection 1 shall be punished with imprisonment for life. So, you see if grievous hurt has been caused for any of the above purposes then the punishment shall be imprisonment for life or imprisonment of either description. It could be simple, it could be rigorous but for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. Then under section 120 the act is the same causing hurt or grievous hurt but the objective would be to extort confession from that person or to compel restoration of property from that person. See the police officers they have been vested certain powers which they can exercise while they conduct investigation but under no circumstances are they allowed to inflict any kind of a hurt or grievous hurt on the one who has been arrested or the one who has been apprehended unless and until there is some sort of force which they require in order to apprehend that person or to prevent that person from running away till that time they are not allowed to use any kind of force. See torture in police custody is something which is expressly forbidden under the law. So what does section 120 says? Whoever voluntarily causes hurt for the purpose of extorting from the sufferer or from any person interested in the sufferer any confession or any information which may lead to the detection of an offence or misconduct or for the purpose of constraining the sufferer or any person interested in the sufferer to restore or to cause the restoration of any property or valuable security or to satisfy any claim or demand or to give information 
which may lead to the restoration of any property or valuable security shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to seven years and shall also be liable to fine. So, you see police have powers to conduct investigation, but during investigations they cannot inflict hurt or grievous hurt upon any person. See, there are certain illustrations. A. A police officer tortures Z in order to induce Z to confess that he committed a crime. A is guilty of an offence under this section because what has been inflicted on that person is either hurt, it could be of grievous, it could be grievous also in nature. Then, illustration B. A. A police officer tortures B to induce him to point out where certain stolen property is deposited. A is guilty of an offence under this section. Illustration C. A. A revenue officer torture Z in order to compel him to pay certain arrears of revenue due from Z. Again, A is guilty of an offence under this section. Clause 2. Whoever voluntarily causes grievous hurt for any purpose referred to in subsection 1 shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. So, you see if simple hurt is inflicted punishment will be up to 7 years, but if grievous hurt has been inflicted in any of the above circumstances punishment can go up to 10 years imprisonment. Now, Coming to section 121, in 120 we were talking about hurt or grievous hurt which is inflicted by a public servant and here we are talking about hurt or grievous hurt which has been inflicted against a public servant or against any person under circumstances with the objective to deter a public servant from performing his duties. So, what does the law say? Whoever voluntarily causes hurt to any person being a public servant in the discharge of his duty as such public servant or with intent to prevent to or deter that person or any other public servant from discharging his duty as such public servant or in consequence of anything done or attempted to be done by that person in the lawful discharge of his duty as such public servant shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 5 years or with fine or with both. See merely obstructing a public servant in the lawful discharge of his duties is also a punishable offence, but if in doing so you have voluntarily caused hurt then the punishment could be imprisonment of either description for a term up to 5 years. Then. Whoever voluntarily causes grievous hurt to any person being a public servant in the discharge of his duty as such public servant. So, here we are talking about grievous hurt or with intent to prevent or deter that person or any other public servant from discharging his duty as such public servant or in consequence of anything done or attempted to be done by that person in the lawful discharge of his duty as such public servant shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which shall not be less than 1 year, but which may extend up to 10 years. See it is 1 year is the minimum, I mean under no circumstance can such person be punished for less than 1 year imprisonment and then it may also go up to 10 years. Now section 122, voluntarily causing hurt or grievous hurt on provocation. So, whoever voluntarily causes hurt on grave and sudden provocation. Again, the provocation should be both grave as well as sudden. See, grave and sudden provocation serves as a mitigating factor in all crimes because what happens? You would not have committed that act had it not been for the grave and sudden provocation which came from the other person due to which you were compelled to do that act because or of which you lost control over yourself and due to which you ended up committing that act. So, here what it says, whoever voluntarily causes hurt on grave and sudden provocation, if he neither intends nor knows himself to be likely to cause hurt. See that is the basis of this exception of grave and sudden provocation, 
that because of that grave and sudden provocation, a person is deprived of his self-control due to which the person does not intend nor does he know voluntarily he does not do such a thing so as to cause harm to that person but while deprived of the power of self-control by account of that uh, grave and sudden provocation, the person does that action. So, whoever voluntarily causes hurt on grave and sudden provocation, if he neither intends nor knows himself to be likely to cause hurt to any person other than the person who gave the provocation shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to one month or with fine which may extend to 5000 rupees or with both. So, this is just a token punishment. See, even if you were deprived of your self-control, still if you have done something which resulted in hurt to a person, you would be sentenced to imprisonment up to one month. And clause 2 talks about grievous hurt. So, whoever voluntarily causes grievous hurt on grave and sudden provocation, if he neither intends nor knows himself to be likely to cause grievous hurt to any person other than the person who gave the provocation shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 5 years. So, 5 is the maximum. It could be a lesser punishment also or with fine which may extend to 10,000 rupees or with both. Again, this section is subject to the same proviso as exception 1 of section 101. What does it say? What is the proviso to section 101? I have reproduced here, this here, provided that the provocation is not sought or voluntarily provoked by the offender as an excuse for killing or doing harm to any person. So, the provocation should come to the accused. It should not be uh, self-sought. It should not be a staged managed situation. Second, it should not be given by anything done in obedience to the law or by a public servant in the lawful exercise of the powers of such public servant. So, a public servant acting in the lawful exercise of his powers, you have no right to be offended by what that person does in the lawful exercise. And third, given by anything done in the lawful exercise of the right of private defense. You are the aggressor, the other person has acted in private defense and then you want to take the plea of grave and sudden provocation, the law will not grant this exception to you in case you were the aggressor and the other person was acting in private defense. Section 123 talks about causing hurt by means of poison etc. So, poison here has a broad meaning. It could be any stupefying, intoxicating or an unwholesome drug or anything which could be harmful to a person. So, what the provision says, whoever administers to, so either you have given it on your own or if you have caused such a substance to be taken. So, the law says whoever administers to or causes to be taken by any person, any poison or any stupefying, intoxicating or unwholesome drug or other thing with intent to cause hurt or with intent to commit or to facilitate the commission of an offence or knowing it to be likely that he will likely thereby cause hurt shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and also be liable to fine. Now section 124. Now, section 124 talks about acid attacks. So, before we got section 124 in the BNS, before that we had section 226 A and B in the IPC which dealt with the crime of acid attack and these were two provisions which were introduced in the Indian Penal Code in the year 2013 after the Criminal Laws Amendment Act suggested the introduction of these two sections to deal with the menace of acid attacks. So, section 226A dealt with the crime of acid attack and 226B dealt with, dealt with attempt to commit acid attacks. So, now that has been put in section 124 of the BNS and it talks about voluntarily causing grievous hurt by use of acid etc. So, it could be acid and it could be any other substance also, but it should necessarily result in grievous hurt. So, what does the law say? Whoever causes permanent or partial damage or deformity to or burns or maims or disfigures or disables any part or parts of the body of a person or causes grievous hurt by throwing acid on 
or by administering acid to that person. See, acid could be administered if you compel a person to drink acid, if you administer acid by means of an injection to any person, or if you throw acid on a person, or by using any other means with the intention of causing or with the knowledge that he is likely to cause such injury or hurt or causes a person to be in a permanent vegetative state shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which shall not be less than 10 years and which may extend to imprisonment for life and with fine provided such fine shall be just and reasonable to meet the medical expenses of the treatment of the victim. See, treatment in cases of acid attacks, it takes a long time, it is very expensive, it requires multiple reconstructive surgeries, the victims, they are supposed to uh, wear uh, high pressure garments, they are supposed to say, uh, stay in AC cooled environment and take protein rich diet, it takes a lot of money. Uh, an effort for an acid victim to get the life back on track. So in such cases, the law has not fixed any particular amount of fine. Here the fine shall be just and reasonable, which will be calculated based upon the injury suffered by the victim and also based upon the capacity of the offender to pay. So depending upon that, the amount of fine shall be fixed and ordinarily what happens, the fine goes to the state. But in case of acid attacks, fine it will be given to the victim provided further that any fine imposed under the subsection shall be paid to the victim. Then attempt, whoever throws or attempts to throw acid on any person or attempts to administer acid to any person or attempts to use any other means with the intention of causing permanent or partial damage or deformity or burns or maiming or disfigurement or disability or grievous hurt to that person shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which shall not be less than five years which may extend to seven years and for the purpose of this section acid includes any substance which has acidic or corrosive character or burning nature that is capable of causing bodily injury leading to scars or disfigurement or temporary or permanent disability. Why this explanation was important is because sometimes there are certain alkalis which can cause more damage than what acid does and that is why they have used the term acid etc. No accused should be allowed to take the plea that see what I used was not an acid but an alkali. See if an alkali also has such kind of a corrosive active, uh, qualities which can result in damage that would also be covered herein and for the purpose of this section permanent or partial damage or deformity or permanent vegetative state shall not be required to be irreversible. Reversible. If by virtue of medical treatment it get reversed, still the accused would be held punishable for this crime. So students, that would be all for this lecture. We will meet you soon. Thank you.